he did the same and came to find me several times at night. This went on for a few weeks until the day to... Slavery is the shared dark side of the history of many nations around the globe. But apart from the accounts of our school books and some memorable dates, what do we really know about the struggle to put an end to the slave trade? Join us as we look at disturbing truths about slave breeding farms and slavery. Number 11. Physical Tortures Millions of Africans were kidnapped, enslaved, and shipped across the Atlantic to the Americas under horrific conditions beginning in the 16th century. During the agonizing journey, nearly 2 million people died at sea. Enslavement of black people in the United States created wealth, opportunity, and prosperity for millions of Americans over two centuries. As American slavery developed, an elaborate and enduring mythology about black people's inferiority was created to legitimize, perpetuate, and defend slavery. This mythology survived the Civil War's formal abolition of slavery. During that time, slaves were subjected to gruesome and horrifying torture. Whipping, shackling, hanging, beating, burning, mutilation, branding, rape, and imprisonment were all used to punish them. The overseer's menacing scowl scrutinized every slave's movement, glance, and breath. If the overseer ordered it, he could be stripped naked and paraded around town. If the overseer demanded it, the slave could be beaten raw with leather or metal. At the overseer's request, the slave could be branded with hot iron, a mark of shame as well as pain. The United States antebellum era saw the country built, divided, and even go to war over the issue of slavery. Slavery would cost the first African Americans and their descendants today through coercion, humiliation, and racial supremacy. Number 10. Endless Work Days Most slaves were forced to work from sunrise to sunset. Some slave owners made their slaves work every day, while others gave their slaves one day off per month, and still others gave their slaves Sundays off. Slaves would spend their free time repairing their huts, making pots and pans, and relaxing. Some plantation owners gave their slaves a small plot of land where they could grow vegetables to supplement their diet. Slaves were not permitted to read or write, but some were permitted to attend church. The popular Western image of slavery in the Americas depicts enslaved men, women, and children working in agricultural fields. Though most Africans were purchased for field work by American slave owners, enslaved people could be found in almost every occupation in the Americas. However, slavery varied greatly across the Americas, with much depending on the dominant local crop and geography as well as the regional economic, political, and legal systems in place at the time. Many enslaved men were forced to work as seafarers. Some even worked as slaves on slave ships. Other workers were employed on sailing vessels in inland waters and on river systems that provided vital commercial links to the American interior. The itineraries of seafaring vessels occasionally provided a way for runaway slaves to escape colonial bonds. Most enslaved people were put to work directly or indirectly in the sugar industry in parts of Brazil and the Caribbean, where African slave labor on sugar plantations dominated the economy. A complex division of labor was required to run a sugar plantation. Sugarcane field workers worked long hours in hot and dangerous tropical conditions planting, maintaining, and harvesting sugarcane. Field slaves were required to cut down acres of sugarcane and transport it to a wind, water, or animal-powered mill, where the crop's juices were extracted. Slaves in factories worked in hot, humid, and dangerous conditions to convert sugarcane into sugar and rum. The factory and its equipment were maintained by skilled men such as carpenters. Other workers produced food for the owner and slaves. Others looked after the cattle and horses that were required to operate some of the heavy machinery and transport the products. Following the production of sugarcane-derived products, slave labor was used to transport commerce to barges and ships for export into the Atlantic economy. Domestic slaves were responsible for household maintenance and serving the slave owner's family. Other agricultural crops necessitated a diverse range of slave labor to support plantation operations. For enslaved Africans and their descendants, 
There were various forms and conditions of forced labor. Some worked alongside free people, Native Americans, and white indentured laborers in the colonial British Caribbean and North America. There were two major types of labor in colonial British North America, gang labor and task labor. Slaves were assigned tasks in tobacco and rice, and their work was essentially finished when the task was completed. Field gangs, on the other hand, worked in sugar cultivation throughout the day and around the clock during harvest season. Even in sugar, this rigorous regimen lasted six months of the year. The remaining six months were spent planting and tending the fields, which was less taxing than cane cutting. Number 9. Living Conditions Slave living conditions in the antebellum American South were among the worst in human history. They had no rights as legal property of their masters and fared far worse than Roman slaves or medieval serfs. Perhaps only slaves on Caribbean sugarcane plantations fared worse. Africans sold as slaves in the Americas had to rely on their owners for housing or building materials, cooking and eating pots and pans, food and clothing. Many slaves did their best with what they were given. Most did not dare to complain about their living conditions for fear of being whipped or worse. Slaves were assigned a section of the plantation to live in. On some plantations, slaves were provided with housing. On others, slaves were required to build their own homes. Slaves who had to build their own homes tended to build them in the style of the homes they had in Africa, with thatched roofs. Living conditions were cramped, with as many as 10 people sharing a hut at times. They didn't have much furniture and their beds were usually made of straw or old rags. Slaves who worked in the plantation house had slightly better housing close to the house and were provided with better food and clothing than slaves who worked in the fields. In terms of living conditions, they were sometimes given pots and pans for cooking, but often they had to make their own. Because of the long hours they had to work in the fields, they had little free time to create things to improve their living conditions. Some slaves cooked their food in a hollowed out pumpkin shell known as calabash. Most plantation owners did not spend more money on food for their slaves than necessary, so the slaves ate fatty meat and cornbread. Every year, slaves would be given one pair of shoes and three pairs of underwear. Although their owner would provide these and other clothes, they were frequently ill-fitting and made of coarse material. This, of course, contributed to the deplorable living conditions endured by most slaves. Number 8. Forced Family Separations Enslaved African-American families resembled other families who lived in different times and places and under vastly different circumstances in some ways. Some husbands and wives adored each other while others did not. Children sometimes followed their parents' rules, other times they followed their own instincts. Most parents adored and wanted to protect their children, but in some crucial ways the slavery that pervaded their lives made these families very different. Belonging to another human being brought with it its own set of constraints, disruptions, frustrations, and pain. Enslaved people were not allowed to marry legally in any American colony or state. Colonial and state laws regarded them as property and commodities rather than legal persons capable of contracting and marrying. This meant that until 1865, when slavery was abolished in the United States, the vast majority of African Americans were unable to legally marry. Free African Americans could marry in northern states such as New York, Pennsylvania, or Massachusetts, where slavery had ended by 1830. But in the slave states of the South, many enslaved people entered relationships they treated like marriage. They considered themselves husbands and wives despite knowing that their unions were not protected by state laws. Some enslaved people had nuclear families, which included a mother, father, and children. Each family member in these cases belonged to the same owner. Others lived in near-nuclear families where the father was not the same owner as the mother and children. Both slaves and slave owners referred to these male-female relationships as abroad marriages. As his obligation to provide labor for an owner took precedence over his personal needs, a father might live several miles away on a distant plantation and walk to see his family on Wednesday nights and Saturday evenings. Hence, not only did slaves have to work endless hours and suffer, some couldn't even spend time with their own family members. Number 7. Slave Auctions A scramble auction is also known as a grab-and-go slave auction. Slave chip captains would go to great lengths to prepare their captives and set prices for these auctions to ensure they received the highest number of profits possible because there was no prior negotiation or bidding. 
Enslaved people were frequently kept in pens or private jails before being sold, sometimes for days or weeks. The slaves were then either sold directly from the pens or marched to a nearby auction. Every year, thousands of sales took place in the heart of American cities and towns on the steps of courthouses and city halls. Slaves were poked, prodded, and forced to open their mouths for the buyers. The auctioneer would set a starting bidding price. This would be higher for fit young slaves and lower for older, sickly, or very young slaves. Potential buyers would then compete for the highest bid. There would be unsold slaves after the auction. No buyer would want to buy these slaves because they were weak and unhealthy. They were left without food or water until they died because of being unsold. Number 6. Sexual Exploitation Sexual abuse by slaveholders, overseers, and other white men and women with complete power over them was one of the most difficult abuses slaves endured. I know these facts will appear too heinous to bear, but slavery was indeed heinous. Slave women were forced to submit to their master's sexual advances, possibly bearing children who would enrage a master's wife and cause them to be separated for good. Masters forcibly paired good breeders in order to produce strong offspring that could be sold for a high price. Forced breeding in the slave quarters manifested itself as an indirect form of rape, with powerless enslaved males and females becoming the victims of reproductive abuse they did not willingly consent to. Resistance resulted in harsh punishment and often death. Number 5. Inadequate Health Care White masters, who were frequently brutal and violent, dehumanized the enslaved people who worked for them and became wealthy because of their labor. Slaveholders justified their treatment by citing widely held beliefs about black inferiority and physical differences between blacks and whites. Racist medical theory, which held that blacks were inherently inferior and animal-like, requiring maltreatment to be fit for work, was a critical component. Slaves were malnourished, overworked, and overcrowded, which facilitated germ transmission. So did their living conditions, bare cold and windowless or close to it. Slaves were unable to maintain personal hygiene because they were not paid. Clothes went unwashed, baths were rare, dental care was scarce, and beds remained filthy. Body lice, ringworm, and bed bugs were all prevalent. This treatment began in slave dungeons constructed by Europeans on the African coasts, where enslaved blacks awaited shipment to the New World. In Ghana, for example, 200 people were confined in cramped quarters where they ate, slept, urinated, and defecated. According to archaeological findings, the dirt floors were soaked in vomit, urine, feces. The dungeon's conditions were so dangerous that cleaning it was discouraged. Those who tried risked contracting smallpox and intestinal infections. Diseases such as typhus, measles, mumps, chickenpox, typhoid, and others were prevalent among enslaved people in the colonies and later the states. The slave owner only brought in a doctor as a last resort. Instead, the white master and his wife would provide health care, even though neither was a trained physician. Older enslaved women contributed as well, bringing knowledge of herbs, roots, plants, and midwifery from Africa to the Americas. Blacks had no say in their care as they did in everything else. If a doctor was involved, black patients were not always informed about their condition. The medical report was delivered to the slave owner directly. Black women played a variety of roles. They were, after all, part of the labor force. They also looked after the sick. They were, however, the machines that produced more black bodies. Slave owners needed a new source of labor after the mid-Atlantic slave trade was prohibited. That possibility was provided by a pregnant, enslaved black woman baby born into slavery meant profits that could last generations, a product that required little investment. Number 4. Cotton Plantation With cash crops of tobacco, cotton, and sugarcane, America's southern states became the nation's economic engine. Their preferred fuel? Human enslavement. King cotton was a term used to describe the American South's economy in the years leading up to the Civil War. Cotton was especially important to the southern economy. And because cotton was in high demand in both America and Europe, it created a unique set of circumstances. Cotton cultivation had the potential to generate significant profits. However, because most cotton was picked by enslaved people, the cotton industry was essentially synonymous with the system. And as a result, the thriving textile industry, which was centered on mills in both the northern states and England, was inextricably linked to the institution of American enslavement. 
When the United States banking system was rocked by periodic financial panics, the cotton-based economy of the South seemed to be immune to the problems. Following the Panic of 1857, a South Carolina Senator, James Hammond, taunted Northern politicians during a debate in the United States Senate, saying, You dare not make war on cotton. No power on the planet dares to wage war against it. Cotton reigns supreme. Because the English textile industry imported large amounts of cotton from the American South, some Southern political leaders hoped that Great Britain would support the Confederacy during the Civil War. This did not occur. Cotton had been the economic backbone of the South prior to the Civil War, so the loss of enslaved labor brought about by emancipation altered the situation. However, with the introduction of sharecropping, which in practice amounted to enslaved labor, the reliance on cotton as a primary crop persisted well into the 20th century. Number 3. Breeding Enslaved women's stories are frequently forgotten or overlooked in public history and education, particularly in Louisiana, leaving much to the public unknown about what life was like for them. They faced extreme harm and discrimination not only because of their race, but also because they were women. Because of differences that existed during slavery, black women and white women have several cultural and experiential differences today. The over-sexualization of black women and girls in modern America is a notable experiential difference. When black girls are children, they are not typically viewed as innocent, a concept that dates to slavery, when young girls and women were routinely sexually assaulted. White society in America believed that black women were innately lustful beings throughout the period of slavery. Because the ideal white woman was pure and modest to the point of prudishness in the 19th century, the perception of the African woman as hypersexual made her both the object of white man's abhorrence and his fantasy. Within the confines of slavery, masters frequently felt it was their right to engage in sexual relations with black women. Female slaves sometimes agreed to advances in the hope that such relationships would increase the chances that they or their children would be freed by the master. Most of the time, slave owners took slaves by force. Number 2. The Winds of Change Was Europe's rise to wealth built on the blood, sweat, toil, and death of slaves? During their colonization of the Americas, Europeans enslaved millions of men and women on the African continent. Those who made it across the Atlantic were forced to work on sugar, tobacco, cotton, and coffee plantations in the Caribbean and North and South America. Europeans amassed vast wealth because of the slave trade, plantation production, and the larger triangular trade between Europe, Africa, and the Americas. Growth accelerated in Europe during the century, when the slave trade and overseas slavery in European colonies reached their peak. The changes taking place in schools across America will finally teach students the truth about slavery and how atrocious it was. They will learn how Europeans and Americans profited and exploited other people for their own gain without hesitation. Number 1. Escaping to Freedom Escaping bondage and fleeing to freedom was a risky and potentially fatal decision. Making the decision to leave loved ones, including children, was heartbreaking. Surviving the elements without proper clothing, finding food and shelter, and navigating into unknown territory while evading slave catchers all added to the peril of the journey. To escape slavery, freedom seekers used a variety of methods. Most of the time, they traveled by land at night on foot, horse, or wagon. Drivers hid self-liberators in false compartments built into their wagons or under produce loads. Slaves fleeing by train were not uncommon. Frederick Douglass disguised himself as a sailor and escaped from the President Street Station, the oldest surviving railroad station in an urban setting, on the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad. Others used boats to navigate the Chesapeake Bay waterways. On their ships, sympathetic boat captains hid freedom seekers. Lear Green, 18, for example, shipped herself in a chest aboard a steamship sailing from Baltimore to Philadelphia. Some of the aspirants were familiar with maritime navigation and relied on the North Star and constellations to guide them. Runaways frequently disguised themselves. Anna Maria Weems disguised herself as a young man to flee her owner, a slave trader from Rockville. Some obtained forged passes or certificates attesting to their free status, while others passed as white due to their light skin color or blended in with the city's large free black population. Along the way, some freedom seekers hid in swamps or wooded thickets, root cellars, secret rooms, attics, barns, fodder houses, and other outbuildings. 
Most freedom seekers probably found their way to freedom on their own, but others were given instructions that allowed them to move from one safe location to the next. Slavery played a crucial role in the development of the modern world economy, but it was morally wrong, so it should never have existed. What is your opinion on the subject? Why don't you let us know in the comments below? Well, that's it for now. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and let us know in the comments what you think. Check out our other videos and subscribe to be part of the fun. Click on the notification icon so you can see our new videos as soon as they're uploaded. Thanks for watching and see you next time.